All right. Hello, everyone. Um, happy Monday. Uh, welcome to a subspecialty case discussion. Uh, so today's focus is pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, and my name is Maddie. I'll be facilitating the session today. Uh, so today it's really excited because we have two uh, incredible discussants from Ohio State University. We have Dr. Avi Cooper and Dr. Kate Schrate. So I am actually going to turn the mics over to both of them so that they can introduce themselves. And if they're up for it, they can share kind of a story of a time that they've had together. Um, so maybe first I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Awesome. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so my name is Kate Schrake. Um, I have the privilege to serve as one of the chief fellows at OSU. So I'm in my, my final year of training. Uh, so it's finally coming to an end, which is crazy. Um, I actually thought today that it's April and my fellowship is over in June and that's it for training. So, <laughs> so the realization is starting to sink in. Um, so definitely looking forward to that next step, becoming officially an attending. So that will be a new adventure. Um, I'm born and bred Ohio. Um, I've done most of my living and training in Ohio. Um, I did undergrad at OU. So I was a Buckeye long before I was a, um, sorry, I was a Bobcat long before I was a Buckeye. Um, did my med school at the University of Toledo, escaped Ohio for a hot to do my residency at the University of Pittsburgh, um, and then had the honor of matching here at Ohio State um, and have never looked back. It's been wonderful. So. Amazing. Awesome. Well, we're so grateful that you're here, Kate. Thank you. And yeah, over to you, Avi. Yeah, so good to be back um, uh, at the virtual uh, morning report. Um, so my name is Avi Cooper. Uh, I have the honor of working with Kate uh, as um, a program director of our pulmonary and critical care medicine fellowship here, um, uh, a job that I took over uh, this past July. I was APD, assistant program director, uh, for three years before that. Um, originally from Atlanta, Georgia, moved to Boston, um, and uh, stayed, was there for medical school at Harvard um, uh, and residency at Beth Israel Deaconess, really fell in love with medical education, um, and then came to Ohio State for, for fellowship and, and loved it here and stayed on faculty. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm we're just you know honored to be here and honored, it's just wonderful to be able to work with uh, an amazing um, educator and physician uh, such, as, such as Kate. Um, and, uh, yeah, and in terms of, um, like a cool thing that we've done together, um, we've done, like, we've collaborated, I guess, a lot on sort of educational things. I was just going to share something about Kate. Um, so she's really, really talented physician, educator, um, you know, she's the complete package, um, and very fortunate, uh, University of Kentucky is very fortunate to having, uh, have her join them as a, as a clinician educator, uh, next year. Um, but Kate is like a really talented, like, crafter. Um, so I didn't know, um, and so I don't, I hope you don't mind me saying that, but like, she's just really good at like making things. And so I was, it, you made like, like Halloween jewelry, if I remember correctly this past year. And so like my wife, like still wears your earrings, like <laughs> that's so cool. What's your favorite type of craft to make Kate? I'm big into paper crafting. Um, so for years and years, um, I made my own Christmas cards. I would buy cardstock and like cut out stupidly intricate little things um so but of course you know residency put a little damper on that and it's uh, I haven't gotten to it during fellowship but um definitely something I hope to get back to and um, I'm actually in the midst of building a house um down in Lexington where I'm going and I already have my craft room planned out so <laughs> oh my gosh building a house I mean that's a huge craft in and of itself <laughs> <laughs> very true very true that's probably why that I like it so. <laughs> yeah Wow. Well, thank you both so much. And I don't know if Avi mentioned it, but you likely all recognize his voice because he's the co-host of the most really amazing podcast, The Curious Clinicians, that you should all um, check out. But thank you both so much for being here. And uh, we also have Jess Zimmo, who will be presenting the case. Jess, um, thank you so much. And do you also want to unmute, introduce yourself, and maybe share um, a fun hobby that you've been into recently? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name's Jess. Um, I'm an internal medicine resident at Northwestern University um, by way of New Hampshire originally. I went to Northeastern for undergrad, so familiar with Boston. Um, and then I went to University of Pittsburgh for medical school. So I kind of overlap with both of you actually. Um, so hopping my way out West, I suppose. Um, one of my favorite hobbies is baking. Um, I love to bake kind of more elaborate cakes, but sort of similar to your crafting um, in residency, I sort of fall back on my 
uh, comfort zone of my own chocolate chip cookie recipe that I love to make and share. Um, but that's sort of my go to. That sounds absolutely delicious. Well, um, thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited to to learn from the case. So Jess, whenever you're ready, you can um, jump into the first aliquot. Sure. Um, so this case is about a 30 year old female who has a history of asthma and she comes into the emergency department with shortness of breath, wheezing and a productive cough. Um, for the last three weeks, she's had nighttime awakenings every single night, persistent shortness of breath, and then a cough that's been producing some green sputum occasionally has streaks of blood in it. She's been using her daily asthma medications as prescribed, uh, except in the last several days, She's had to use her uh, epitropium albuterol nebulizers every four hours scheduled until today when she ran out of her medication. Uh, so her shortness of breath continued to worsen after she ran out of the nebs and so she came into the ED. Uh, if there's anything else, uh, Kate and Avi, that you want to know in terms of review of systems, I don't know if you have other questions for her, for history. Okay. So what I'm hearing is she already has an established diagnosis of asthma. Uh, do we know how well controlled it is at baseline? So I'll get into her uh, diagnosis of asthma and history of asthma, uh, but briefly, she's kind of struggled with asthma control in the last few months. And what time of year is this happening? This is late summer, early fall. Just thinking a lot of time, like what are those triggers and what are the things that um, can cause people to exacerbate um, with the history of asthma that's in her presentation, something that I'm considering um, in terms of what could be setting her asthma off in terms of worsening her control recently, um, in addition to landing her here in the hospital now. Um, okay. And Jess, do you want to go ahead and finish through kind of the review systems and then we can pause to hear um, kind of their thinking on the differential and um, next steps? Sure. In terms of positive, she has had a couple nosebleeds in the last week, but she thinks that's mostly from her nebulizers that she's been using so frequently. Um, she has a mild headache. Uh, and then she does have a dog allergy, but she hasn't been around dogs recently. She lives in a basement, but she doesn't think um, there's a ton of mold there. Maybe there's mold in her basement, but she's not sure. Uh, otherwise, she doesn't have any sick contacts. Uh, she um, does not have chest pain, no nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, other abdominal symptoms, uh, no fevers or chills. Uh, and then um, what else? Uh, no rashes as well and no recent travel. All right, perfect. So hey, this is quite a lot of information already, but you know, in this 30 year old woman with a history of asthma with now presenting kind of with shortness of breath and a productive cough, what's kind of going through your mind in terms of potential differentials and what other information would you wanna know? Yeah, great question. So I think the first things that come to mind are um, making sure I'm, I'm thinking of horses instead of zebras for my first pass through. Um, so uh, asthma, a lot of these symptoms and things in, uh, that she's been having do fit. Um, the timeline is a bit long if you're thinking of an asthma exacerbation alone. So I'm already starting to wonder just based on the subacute nature of it? Um, is this something more involved than just a simple asthma exacerbation? Um, I'd also want to know, it sounds like she's been struggling with control for the past few months, but I would want her to really reflect on three weeks ago thereabouts. Is there anything that changed in her lifestyle, anything she was exposed to that might have triggered whatever this is, um, whether related to her asthma or something else? Yeah, I, I agree with Kate. I think, you know, walking in the room, I think the, fir the first concern and thought that I would have is that this is probably status asthmaticus. I would worry, you know, it's sort of unresponsive to her, you know, initial improvement with her, her nebs at home and then running out and she's, um, it sounds like she's, she's um, you know, uh, not doing well from that standpoint. I think I would want to be 
you know, open to, to other possibilities, but I think in the moment, status as Madagus would be sort of what I was most, most worried about. You know, and I think um, sort of like to, to Kate's point, thinking about um, this more sort of subacute nature of this, um, I always, you know, when I, when I see someone who has difficult to control asthma, I always wanna think about, you know, things like adherence to inhaler therapy, access to inhalers, um, exposures to um, allergens or irritants. Um, including, you know, cigarette smoke, vape, marijuana, things like that. Um, and then also sort of thinking about um, what we call sort of asthma plus syndromes, um, things that can make somebody um, have sort of more difficult to control asthma as well, things like EGPA, ABPA, um, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, and, you know, especially with the, the streaks of blood, the epistaxis, um, you know, EGPA would, would, would potentially come to mind. Obviously, we'd have to know um, a lot more about her history, but I would be wondering about some of those things in the back of my mind while trying to um, stabilize her from a bronchospasm standpoint. Mm -hmm. And along those lines too, with um, access and compliance to inhalers, inhaler technique, um, because it's, it's so common for even the most uh, knowledgeable patients to use their inhalers incorrectly. Um, so understand how she's using your inha her inhalers, is she using a spacer, um, but also importantly, is she getting relief from her inhalers? Um, it might be that we're barking up the wrong tree. If she says, yeah, usually my inhalers and my, my NEBs really help with my asthma, but it hasn't touched my symptoms in the last three weeks. So that might jog my, my mind to say, hmm, maybe this isn't her asthma then, maybe it's something else, uh, asthma plus as Avi alluded to. Amazing. And I was wondering if you guys both mentioned kind of asthma plus syndrome. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more kind of what you mean by that, that term. So a lot of diseases can, in a person that has asthma or can uh, sound like asthma symptoms can be asthma caused by something else. So a lot of the ones um, that Avi said, like EGPA, um, GPA, those are like vasculitic diseases that can cause asthma-like symptoms. Um, so, and then with her, she does have some evidence of, of blood, which could uh, indicate some vasculitis phenomenon occurring. Um, and that was like the epistaxis and the hemoptysis that she's in, endorsing, or this blood streaked sputum. Um, so that could mean there's some sort of vasculitis occurring there as well. But also the uh, ABPA, uh, which is a fungal infection, um, that can frequently cause asthma-like symptoms that is refractory and not getting better. And it's not until you actually identify and treat that, that the asthma gets better too. Perfect. Thank you so much. Avi, anything else to add before the next aliquot? No, no. I, I, um, I think the, the, you know, Kate's sort of encapsulation of the asthma plus uh, syndromes is, is really, was really nicely done. And I think it it's it you know it tends to come to mind more for us I think when someone is difficult has difficult to control asthma um, we you know it's you know we want to sort of think about is is there more going on so that's where the plus comes in sort of more going on than just run of the mill asthma. Got it. All right, Jess, we'll turn to you for the next aliquot. Sure. So a little bit more about her past medical history and her history of asthma. She was actually only diagnosed five months ago uh, during a pregnancy, at which time she was admitted to the hospital with shortness of breath, productive cough, and blood streak sputum again. Uh, she was treated with steroids. She didn't actually require supplemental oxygen at that time, um, but then was diagnosed with asthma. Um, she then had another exacerbation a couple of months later. Uh, same symptoms of shortness of breath, productive cough, and blood streak sputum, again treated with steroids. And then her last exacerbation was two months ago, uh, presented the same symptoms again, shortness of breath, productive cough. At that time, she actually had rhinovirus um, and did require nasal cannula for supplemental oxygen and was discharged with a little bit longer of a prednisone taper of about two weeks. Um, she has never had uh, other respiratory symptoms as a child. Uh, she didn't have eczema as a child, uh, but does have environmental allergies similar to the dog allergy, like I said. And then in terms of kind of social, no tobacco or smokeless tobacco, uh, no alcohol or other substances. 
In terms of her current medications for asthma, uh, she has the albuterol inhaler and then the epitropium albuterol nebulizers. And then she's been taking a fluticasone inhaler, 110 micrograms, two puffs twice a day. That's all, right. all that I have for her past medical. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, well, Avi, maybe we'll turn to you first this time, just to see if, um, you know, based on this new information we got about her history, how is this impacting how you're thinking about the patient and the differential? You know, I think it would make me suspicious that there's something else. There's something in addition to sort of run of mill asthma going on. The tempo just doesn't quite fit with how sort of, you know, usual asthma goes in the sense that sometimes we do see somebody comes in, their first, their first presentation is, um, with an exacerbation. Um, we especially can see that post-infection, meaning somebody has, say, maybe a viral infection and they get a post-infectious um, uh, reactive airways disease, which can sort of settle into asthma. Um, but usually, usually with sort of appropriate inhaler therapy, um, which, you know, in, uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroids are the backbone um, for asthma, you usually get better control of it. Um, and so it's a little bit surprising to hear that, you know, that she would you know, get started on inhaler therapy, get treated with, with um, oral corticosteroids, and then have these sort of frequent sort of flare-ups. Um, so I think for me, that would be the thing that I would, you know, again, my, we're sort of doing two things at once, right? We're thinking about her acute issue, we're wondering and stabilizing that, and we're wondering about something more chronic, um, uh, perhaps something inflammatory in the background. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of where I would be thinking. Kate, okay, what do you think? Uh, I totally agreed, and I'm really intrigued that her diagnosis was during pregnancy. Um, is she still pregnant at the time of this presentation? No, she's still delivered. She is breastfeeding still, but I think she is uh, three or four months postpartum. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so got diagnosed within the last trimester of pregnancy then? Okay. Um, so that kind of caught my attention too, um, since she doesn't have any uh, prior history of reactive airway disease or asthma as a kid. Um, and then have we done family history yet either? If, if so, I'm, I apologize. I didn't mention it. Um, there's no history of asthma or other ectopic symptoms. Um, really nothing super pertinent. Kate, do you mind explaining kind of what in the family history were you maybe uh, keeping an ear out for? Any, certainly any pulmonary diseases, any diseases with chronic infection, um, any like CF in the family. She's a bit on the older side um, to be diagnosed with CF, but um, with so many, with so much variation in cystic fibrosis, um, you have to be suspicious for it pretty much at any time point. Um, so especially with like the blood streak sputums and multiple exacerbations with um, what sound like kind of purulent sputum, um, I'd be wanting to know kind of what, what her airways look like, both from like a PFT standpoint, as well as imaging. Um, and then with uh, the pregnancy thrown in there, you know, that obviously has a lot of physiologic changes that go along with it. Um, so I, I too, like Avi, I'm kind of thinking away from just plain old asthma and what else could be going on um, with this lady. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Kate. And I guess the, um, I guess a related thought is sort of like how she actually was even diagnosed with asthma, right? Because sometimes it can be a little bit of an evanescent diagnosis um, in the sense that we, we sort of, sometimes it sort of like feels like asthma, like the person's like wheezing and we say, oh, this is some coughing, this is probably asthma. Um, but, you know, ideally we would have sort of documented um, reversible bronchoconstriction, um, you know, sort of the, that, you know, things like that, that would be, you know, or, or you know, sort of var variable, um, you know, pulmonary function um, that would fit with that along with sort of other features, um, you know, like, like Jess was saying of, of A to P that we might be looking for, um, you know, eosinophils on a, on a, you know, peripheral um, diff, you know, things like that, that can sort of create a signal that this is probably asthma. Um, but I think the question of like how she was diagnosed is, um, is an important one. Yeah, and I think someone mentioned in the chat too, whether she had had previous imaging. 
Um, she had only had chest x-rays in the past, no CTs. And then kind of to your point, she was just diagnosed based on having kind of shortness of breath, wheezing, responding to steroids during that first hospitalization uh, and hasn't been able to get pulmonary function testing yet. And Jess, did she ever have any like respiratory issues before this pregnancy? Like before this, she was like completely fine, like no bronchitic anything. Cause some of people will say, oh yeah, I get this like yearly bronchitis and you're like, well, that was probably, you know, asthma um, the whole time. But had she had stuff that where it like something respiratory or, or not at all until age 30? Really? No. When you ask her, she says, I never had any issues with my breathing until during my pregnancy. And when I had to go to the hospital. Um, and then I uh, see something about travel history in the chat, no recent travel. And she is um, from the Chicago area. Awesome. Well, Jess, maybe you can take us through the physical exam. Sounds good. So her vitals in the emergency department, her first set of vitals, her blood pressure is 107 over 66. Her heart rate is 125. Her respiratory rate is 23. And she's adding 88% on room air. Uh, in general, she is in acute distress. Uh, most notably, her chest and lung exam, she's tripoding when you go to examine her. She can't speak in complete sentences. She has coarse, coarse breath sounds with wheezes bilaterally. Uh, no crackles, though, um, in all lung fields. And then cardiovascular-wise, she has the rapid rate, but regular rhythm, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. Her abdomen is benign. Extremities are warm and well perfused. She has no edema. Her skin is warm and dry. She has no rashes. And then neurologically, she's fully alert and oriented. She's moving all four extremities equally and spontaneously, and she has no vocal deficits that are obvious to you. So we can pause there again. Perfect. So maybe we'll turn to you, Kate, and um, really just see how are you interpreting this physical exam and how would you think of initial management at this point? Well, I, I think to, to label this patient as sick or not sick, uh, this patient is sick. Um, I am very worried about this patient, even though we've, we've talked about, and if we had the luxury of time before this patient came up to us or whatnot, um, you know, we've kicked around a lot of ideas. Uh, but if what I knew about this patient walking into the room was she has a history of asthma, is what sounds like four months postpartum or so, um, and is tripoding in front of me, uh, mildly hypoxic with uh, a rapid heart rate, um, I would be very concerned. I would be rounding up resources and people to come assist me at the bedside. Um, she's someone that needs immediate attention not somebody that you can, you know, walk away from and, and, you know, go grab a cup of coffee and, and talk to whoever you meet in the hallway. Um, so I think, you know, the, her vitals, while well, her blood pressure is probably pretty normal for a 30 year old, um, assuming that she's been young and healthy, aside from this recent diagnosis of asthma, um, I'm def definitely on high alert with her. Um, so when, when you said coarse breath sounds, but no crackles, does she actually have wheezes? Uh, she does have wheezes when you go listen to her. I okay. pulled exactly what the initial note said, but she does have wheezing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, to some extent, um, hearing wheezing is it's actually a good thing in this situation because mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can hear nothing. You can literally hear a quiet chest if the bronchospasm is that severe, and you'll the wheeze will actually emerge as the bronchoconstriction starts to sort of subside. Um, so sometimes um, wheezing, absence of wheezing is actually more ominous in this situation. Obviously, like Kate is saying, this person is in, she's, she's an extremis. Um, I'd be like reaching for the BiPAP mask, like as I'm talking to her and applying it to her face. Um, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, this is, it, it's, it sounds like very, very severe bronchospasm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think, you know, the other thing, and th th I don't think it would apply to this case necessarily, but always, I always try to listen to the neck when I'm, um, you know, examining someone who I think may be in status asthmaticus um, because of vocal cord dysfunction can fool you. And it can really look a lot like status asthmaticus because, and people with asthma have vocal cord dysfunction, it's really common. 
but um, and you know the their airway is obstructed. It's just like it's just farther up, right? It's not it's not you know um, intrathoracic. It's it's in their neck. You know their their glottic airway is obstructed because of vocal cord dysfunction. They can't breathe. It's I mean it's they'll wheeze. They will look all the world mm -hmm. like status asthmaticus. And sometimes you don't really figure it out until you if you intubate the person. Um, because someone who, who is like this, who you think is in status as manicus and you, you innovate them, they're gonna be very challenging to manage on the vent. And someone who you fix the problem by bypassing their vocal cords, they will be like just fine. And it will be like almost like magic. And you'll be like, oh, wow. And you know, I've, I've seen, you know, sometimes you'll see patients who've been innovated 10 times for asthma and you're like, ah, <laughs> I really, really wonder what they looked like after the, the, you know, the endotracheal tube went in because if it's, if it's vocal cord dysfunction, they'll be very easy to manage on the vent and you'll be like, it's probably not asthma. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and Avi, I'll just bring board off of what you said, reaching for BiPAP as you walk into the room, 100% uh, agree. And, and thankfully that's a strategy that um, if you don't know, if you've listened to the neck and you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe I hear something and you're not sure. Thankfully BiPAP is something that can kind of acutely rescue that situation as well. Um, so BiPAP, of course, would be my first grab. I'd be calling respiratory to give uh, several nebs back to back uh, for as much bronchodilation as I can give her, making sure she has steroids on board, um, given the productive sputum and cough, starting her on antibiotics. Um, but obviously those things take time. Um, so I think what can help her um, from this acute distress standpoint um, with some mild hypoxemia is that support of BiPAP. So that would of course be, and it would be BiPAP, not CPAP in this, in this um, instance. And that's a, an important differentiator um, because with CPAP, it's just one pressure. So every time the patient breathes in, they do all the work versus BiPAP, um, there's two different pressures. And so they're gonna get support on that inhale on that um, when they take a breath in. Um, so that would be something that I, very care and very careful with too, because as much as it can help, it can also be harmful if you're not standing there watching how the patient reacts to that positive pressure ventilation um, and making adjustments as needed. Yeah, I guess there's two other sort of adjunctive therapies to sort of consider in this situation that can be done sort of quickly at the bedside. Um, one um, is magnesium. Um, so, you know, you can push like two to four grams of, of IV, IV magnesium. It's a, it's a pretty decent, um, bronchodilator uh, because of its calcium channel blocking properties. Um, and then also epinephrine. So um, typically done more in the ER where I imagine this, this person probably is. Um, but yeah, you can do you, you can do pushes of, of, of epi to um, obviously subcode doses of epi um, because of the sort of profound um, beta agonism that it provides. Incredible. I love these pearls, especially kind of the difference between CPAP and BiPAP, um, really fantastic. Um, I guess one thing before we move on, just for kind of the students listening, I wanted to go briefly back to the physical exam findings. And if you could talk a little bit about, you know, for students, important differentiating factors, wheezes versus crackles and kind of the significance of both. Yeah, so um, these are like very important breath sounds to know the distinction between. So a wheeze is typically higher pitched. Um, a crackle is um, kind of sounds like um, uh, like wet and sometimes dry crackles, you can actually distinguish between a crackle being dry versus wet. Dry crackles can be sometimes consistent with like a fibrotic lung disease, um, whereas a wet crackle might be consistent with something like pneumonia or pulmonary edema. Um, but they're kind of on a spectrum. Um, wheezes definitely are more consistent with like a bronchoconstrictive process is that air whistles through a constricted airway. Um, but they're not, they don't have to be mutually exclusive as in if you don't hear, um, as, as Avi pointed out, if you don't hear wheezes, that doesn't mean they don't have bronchoconstriction and doesn't mean they don't have asthma. Um, so, you, so you listen with a grain of salt knowing that, you know, I hear what I hear, but it can't be the only thing that informs your differential. Yeah, what, what I always tell, wet, wet crackle sounds like Rice Krispies and milk and dry crackle sounds like Velcro. Um, mm. And <laughs> so, they're great and, analogies. <laughs> and so, yeah, so dry crackles usually are, in, are more indicative of an interstitial process. Um, and so if you hear what sounds like Velcro, that's more suggestive of that versus a rectal Rice Krispies that suggests an alveolar filling process, um, like pulmonary edema, pneumonia, something like that. Um, but yeah, 
it's yeah, I found that I, I still remember hearing that. And I was like, uh, that's it. I'm, that's how I'm going to remember this. Yeah, that will definitely stick and also makes me want to have cereal. But yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Jeff, we'll turn to you for the next all class. Sure. So we can jump into the first bit of workup that she has done. Uh, so she is put on BIPAP and she's admitted to the medical ICU. She has a VBG uh, obtained while she's already been on BiPAP for a little bit of time since we were stabilizing first. Uh, pH was 7.39 and the CO2 was 42 on that. Um, her CBC has a white count of 18, a hemoglobin of 14.1, platelet of 389. Her chemistry has a sodium of 138, potassium 4.2, chloride 104. CO2 22, BUN is 18, creatinine is 0.84, which is about her baseline, and then glucose is 104. Her liver function panel is all within normal limits, and then she has a COVID test and a respiratory viral panel that are both negative. Um, any questions about the labs? Do you have a, a differential on her CBC? Yeah, so the differential has 30% neutrophils, 18% lymphocytes, 45% uh, eosinophils, and 0.6% basophils. And then in terms of absolute counts, the uh, ANC is 5.5, and then the absolute eosinophil count is 8.2. That's a lot of EOS. Um, in terms, a lot of EOS. In terms of, of imaging EOS. Uh, pictures. Kate, Kate, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, sure. So definitely a, a lot to unpack here. Um, so uh, the, that's probably the highest absolute eosinophil count I've ever heard of. Um, that's very, very high. So that um, immediately draws my attention into one of these uh, kind of like asthma plus symptoms we were debating earlier. And more specifically, I think I would, you know, have to test for them all, but I think in my head, I would rearrange it to probably most concerning for like an eGPA um, or uh, even some eosinophilic uh, derived malignancy. Um, she's young, but malignancy obviously has to be always kept on the table. Um, but I, this is very interesting. And um, the other thing that caught my eye too is with, um, she's not terribly tachypnic, but if she's tripoding and a little hypoxic and really tachycardic, um, and, and we're thinking a bronchoconstrictive process, um, I'm really bothered that she has basically a normal VBG. It's abnormally normal in this case. Um, so I'm very concerned that she is not able to blow off that CO2 that she needs to, which is what's leading her to feel like she needs to tripod um, to try to expel that extra air. So, so, and that keep in mind as well, she was on BiPAP, Jess said. Um, so this is, this is a woman that is not improving with our, our most instant go-to, uh, something to help her. So all the more reason that I'm even more concerned about her. Yeah, I agree. And I guess I'm, I'm wondering if that respiratory rate of 23 is accurate. Um, if she was really, you know, tripoding, she's probably breathing faster than that. And to Kate's very astute point, the normal, um, sort of the, the, it's, um, ominously normal, <laughs> her, uh, her, her, her carbon dioxide levels and pH, um, suggesting that she is, you know, in, she is in respiratory failure. Um, uh, and, you know, I think from a, you know, and from a sort of diagnostic standpoint, yeah, that's a lot of EOS. Wow. Um, and I think, yeah, EGPA probably rises to the top of the list. Um, but, uh, EGPA can sort of, um, can exist uh, on a spectrum with other things, um, like like Kate was saying, you know, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, um, which is sort of like sort of like the eosinophilic phase of eGPA without the sign of sinopulmonary involvement. Obviously, this she clearly if if she has she has sinopulmonary involvement, um, like you know eosinophilic leukemias, um, more esoteric things, parasites. Um, although she doesn't really have a travel history necessarily to support that, um, you know, we I know here in in uh, in Ohio we do have strongyloides. Um, that can be acquired. Um, so I think those are the things that you know you think about that can give you something that high. But I think eGPA sort of would rise to the to the top of the list right now, um, and would worry that she's going to end up uh, potentially innovated soon. 
And I think, you know, the other thing to, to sort of think about um, if this is eGPA, um, so eGPA can sort of be broken down itself into sort of severe and not severe, right? And so um, it can feel a little bit like of a misnomer and that like severe, severe asthma can have non-severe eGPA. <laughs> and it's sort of like, how do we line those up? Um, but, uh, you know, someone who presents with hemoptysis um, if we think that's related to that, and it's um, from a vasculitic involvement, um, you know, usually I think it's defined by like, you know, vasculitic involvement in the lung or in the heart or in the kidneys with like glomerulonephritis, um, then that sort of tips you into the severe eGPA, which obviously is treated much more aggressively and differently upfront within, from an immunosuppression standpoint. And just one other add-on too, eosinophilic pneumonia um, is something to think about too. Timeline doesn't exactly fit because it's pretty acute. Um, and then obviously seeing these chest x-rays in front of you, usually it's accompanied in the acute phase by pleural effusions, which I don't see here. Um, but again, those are just all clues, but perhaps something that would be on my differential at this point as well. Incredible differential for that many eosinophils. Uh, so Jess, why don't you take us through the, the imaging that you have? Sure. So the radiologist read of this chest X-ray, um, there are airspace opacities in the right mid lung and the right upper lobe. Uh, peripheral ground glass densities in the left upper lobe, no pleural effusions and no pneumothorax. Um, their conclusion being bilateral airspace opacities concerning for a multifocal pneumonia. Um, and wondering about the pulmonologist's take on it as well. So are we seeing old on the left side of the screen, new on the right? Okay. Exactly. And how old is the previous one? How many? It's from her last admission two months ago. Okay. Um, so looking at the, the old one first, um, I'll do kind of an abbreviated, you know, a, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, so you have to always, and then consider also like, is the patient rotated? How much do I trust this film of, did they take a good breath in? Um, how are they positioned? How is it penetrated? So there's a lot that goes into reading chest x-rays more than just, I, I see a schmutz in, um, I, see a, I see a white smutch where it should be black. Um, so on her, on her old film, um, there's nothing um, as focal in terms of what we can see on the new film. Um, you, if you trace the pleura, you don't see any uh, pleural effusions on either one of these. Um, she probably has a little bit of prominence in the um, vasculature in the right lower lobe and the, uh, the left lower lobe maybe a little bit, but we can see both diaphragms really clearly. So I'm not worried about any infiltrates in the old one. Um, and then looking back and forth, right and left uh, between both lungs, um, there's nothing that jumps out. Um, in terms of like infiltrates, certainly nothing like the um, new one on the right. And you obviously gave us the, the radiology read already, um, but there's definitely some focal opacities that you can see what used to be white in the old, or what, sorry, what used to be black in the old image now has white, um, which is the new abnormality that we're seeing. So, and then how does this inform my differential? Um, I don't think it changes anything at this point. Um, all of the processes we've discussed can be bilateral. Um, so I don't think I would be taking anything off the differential at this point. All right, fantastic. And Jess, was there another um, imaging you wanted to share? Perfect. Um, so this is sort of a representative slice of the CT scan. I can, I also have a video um, that I can show you.
Um, and so then in terms of things that the radiologist called out on this CT scan, um, clear pleural spaces again, enlarged mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes, they noted, um, a paratracheal lymph node and a left hilar lymph node and a right hilar lymph node as well. Um, the largest one being 1.8 centimeters, uh, clear trachea, some secretions in the left main stem bronchus, diffuse wall thickening, and then multifocal ground glass and dense consolidative opacities in both lungs uh, in a random distribution with peripheral, central, upper, and lower opacities all noted. Um, they did suggest that maybe there was some subpleural sparing of these opacities, um, an overall conclusion being multifocal bilateral ground glass and dense consolidative opacities that could represent infection um, or other process kind of can't rule out, um, as well as the lymphadenopathy that they noted and then bronchial wall thickening. That's a lot going on. <laughs> um, so definitely uh, an abnormal CT. And one that uh, once I see that, my mind says, this is not something that's just simple asthma. Um, so, of course, people with simple asthma can have other common things like pneumonia, but since we know that she has a boatload of eosinophils and some hemoptysis, some um, nosebleeds, I would be very worried about these uh, consolidations we're seeing in the lungs. Um, and then I paid close attention to the distribution and um, kind of locations of these, trying to use that as something to inform my differential. Um, but unfortunately with them being a random distribution affecting all lobes of the lung centrally and peripherally, um, it, it, that basically takes away any um, usefulness in terms of using the location of the abnormalities um, to help inform your differential. Um, and what I mean by that is um, inhalational diseases, things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, other inhalational occupational exposures. Um, if you think about taking a breath into your lungs, a lot of that pathology ends up in the upper lobes. But in her case, that isn't something that immediately comes to mind because it's a random distribution affecting all lobes of the lung. Perhaps you could say how we scrolled through, maybe the uppers are more affected than the lowers, um, but that it would have been an easier thing for me to say, oh, well, it completely spares the lower lung and only affects the upper. And that would have shifted me towards something like an inhalational um, issue. So, um, so I don't think it's important. It, the imaging is obviously really helpful to see, um, but in terms of using it to whittle down our diagnosis, um, I still don't think I can take anything off the table completely. And um, I definitely think she needs a, a bronchoscopy here. Yeah, and I think um, you know, what comes to mind to me in addition to the um, awesome sort of synthesis from, from Kate is, you know, I guess I, I think about sort of four or five things that can fill up an alveolus, right? Um, like blood plus water um, cells, and then um, also protein. That probably doesn't get mentioned enough because pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is a thing too. Um, but typically it's blood, pus, water, and cells. And the fact that she's bringing up blood and mm -hmm. pus, it's probably some mixture of the two. Um, um, but yeah, I would wonder if she has alveolar hemorrhage um, that um, is leading to these, um, these ground glass and, and consolidative opacities. I guess the, the mediastinal adenopathy is sort of intriguing as well. Um, and in that, um, you know, this is sort of a challenge sometimes is we'll see adenopathy and we will sort of characterize it as reactive. And what that really means is like, we don't actually have a full explanation for why it's there, but we think something's going on in the lungs and that it's reactive to that um, versus say, you know, if we're gonna find like the problem there um, and that, you know, and, and where things like lymphoma, sarcoid, like other things. Um, so that, you know, is sometimes a challenge when you see, um, you know, uh, enlarged lymph nodes in the mediastinum, um, usually, unless we have something telling us otherwise, we presume it to likely be reactive to what is going on in the lung parenchyma um, itself. Mm -hmm. And Avi, I was having the same thought too, and uh, Rafa had the, the same one as well. Uh, would you biopsy those lymph nodes? I mean, I'd, 
you think about probably cooling it off first. <laughs> um, but you know, like once I think put it this way, like if you if we were able to diagnose her with something like EGPA, like make a confident diagnosis, then probably not. And you would probably serially image them. Um, but if you really couldn't, if you're like, I don't know why she has eosinophils this high, um, then, you know, you know, you're sort of like thinking like, okay, where are the places that we could potentially get tissue um, if, if need be. Oh, and Jess, really, did she have a UA at all? I don't think we got, did she have a urinalysis? Um, I don't believe they got one uh, because her renal function was at baseline and normal at the time. Uh, so I don't think we have one from the admission. Are you thinking if we saw blood in the UA? Or yeah, just asking, you know, it's sort of, sort of, I think we're sort of trying to build a case for vasculitis potentially. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you saw, if you saw blood there, you would think that maybe even with a normal creatinine, you can have a normal creatinine and still have, um, you know, glomerular involvement. And then before we jump to the next one from Jess, I just wanted to ask both if you could give a little bit of guidance for students, like when should we be considering asking pulmonology for a bronchoscopy? I think that's a, a really tough question. Um, obviously medicine is very multidisciplinary. Um, you always have the option to involve sub, sub, sub specialists. Um, always try to think through the problem on your own first and come up with that specific question for your consultant. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you have a person and you're worried about like this lady, um, she's young, she's in respiratory distress, um, she's arguably not really improving on BiPAP um, with that gas that we've all commented on being concerning about, um, this would be a, a perfect case and she's in the ICU. So she's kind of amongst pulmonary doctors anyway, but um, say she was in a step down unit and still in a hospitalist service. Um, I absolutely would recommend getting a, a consult for this patient and when to consider bronchoscopy is, is a little tough too. Um, a lot of medicine uh, can be done with empiric strategy as the first go. Uh, but in her case, she's got enough going on that that doesn't leave you with a satisfied answer and leaves you with a lot of unknowns, um, that this would be a patient with all of these abnormalities and blood and vital signs and history, plus a very abnormal image, um, I would not hesitate to ask uh, your friendly neighborhood pulmonologist uh, for a bronchoscopy. Yeah, it's a really good question too, right? I mean, it's, it's and it, I think we struggle with it as pulmonologists, like should we bronch this person, should we not? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think like he's saying the, the the question is a little bit secondary at this moment in time because the focus would be on stabilization, but um, in general, so it's hard. I think it's hard for us to give sort of a hard and fast rule when to bronch, when not to bronch. But I can say that if you think the person has alveolar hemorrhage, you should bronch them. Like that's sort of how to diagnose it. Um, and so I think, and obviously you can get a lot of testing done with that also. Um, but like, there's really no way to diagnose alveolar hemorrhage without going in the airways and taking a look. And so. Um, if she was innovated, we would certainly do that, um, you know, uh, but if she wasn't and, and she, her respiratory status could sort of tolerate um, bronchoscopy, again, that's, there's no other way to diagnose alveolar hemorrhage than, than doing a bronch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing to think about too, is, um, you know, like Avi said, sometimes we even struggle, when do we bronch, when don't we? Um, but for teams outside of pulmonology, um, that can be even tougher to kind of grapple with. Of, well, why did they bronch this patient and not that? Or this patient has sick lungs, why aren't they bronching them? Um, a lot of it does come down to how stable is that patient and how well will they tolerate the bronchoscopy? Because um, obviously first rule of medicine is do no harm. And as, as much as we all want answers and as, as much as it can inform treatment for a patient, um, if it's going to put them in harm's way um, and to a degree that is just not safe and not worth it, those are the things that inform our decision. So if, if she's on BiPAP, still not able to ventilate very well, still in respiratory distress, still needing oxygen support with that BiPAP, she's, she's not safe to bronch. Um, so she would need a definitive airway if we needed, if we thought we needed that um, emergent bronchoscopy, um, then she would she would need an airway, she would need to be endotracheally intubated for that to happen. Um, but I think um, our point in general is yes, that she needs a bronchoscopy, but the question is when. 
Um, so in this case, it's less of if she needs one, but when, um, and she would definitely need to settle out um, and, and demonstrate some stability to her uh, respiratory status. All right, great. Well, we'll pass the mic back to Jess to see if a bronchoscopy was in their future and what else um, happened with the patient. Yes, so uh, she did not end up being intubated. She was on BiPAP for maybe 18 hours or so, and then was weaned to nasal cannula with all of the sort of asthma directed therapies that you guys mentioned. Um, so fortunately we did not intubate her, but it meant bronchoscopy did wait some time. In the meantime, she had some more labs. An ESR was 46, a CRP was 23.7. Her ANA came back positive at 1 to 640. And then the autoimmune reflex panel was actually negative. Her ANCA testing was negative as well. Uh, triptase was within normal limits. Her complements were all within normal limits. Um, fungal testing, like urine, histoplasma, blastomyces were negative. She had a PJP um, DFA, which was negative. IgE levels were 518. And then um, she had a hypersensitivity pneumonitis panel sent as well that was negative. Um, Maddie, do you want me to go ahead and jump into the bronchoscopy kind of a week later? That'd be great. Okay. Um, so in terms of inspection, they really just commented on um, diffuse mucosal hypervascularity. And then in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe, they did a BAL. The lower respiratory tract panel was negative. Bacterial culture just showed normal flora. Fungal culture was negative. Um, cytology showed numerous eosinophils. The aspergillus, IgE, galactomannan were negative. Um, and then cell count had 174 nucleated cells. 480 red blood cells, 1% neutrophils, 3% lymphocytes, 27% macrophages, 4% monocytes, and 65% eosinophils. Um, and then AFBs were sent as well off of that, which were negative, um, and PJP also negative off of the AL. Did they do um, serial aliquots for like a DAH protocol? I'm actually not sure, but I don't think they did, or at least the um, individual aliquots are not um, recorded as a lab item. Okay. And was she still coughing up blood leading up to this bronc or had that kind of resolved? Yeah, she did not have large amounts of blood in the sputum while she had been in the hospital over that week. Um, and so I think by the time they had done the bronchoscopy, they um, were less concerned about the alveolar hemorrhage. So yeah, yeah. Avi, maybe we'll pass yeah. the mic to you to yeah. see how you're interpreting all this information and specifically the bronchoscopy. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I'm glad that they were able to get the bronch done. Um, from a, you know, the, the mucosal um, hypervascularity is sort of, Hard to know what to make of that. Um, you know, I think we do our best to be specific based on what we see, but um, you often, you know, unless you see like lesions, it's hard to be. It's hard to sort of be give pathognomonic information about what you see on the, about wh when you do an airway inspection. Um, but again, it does sort of make me think about um, a, a sort of a vascular process. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that's interesting, I don't know what her peripheral eosinophil count was at the time of the bronc. Um, but finding, presumably she'd been on steroids for several days. So finding that many EOs that many days in, it's impressive and suggests again, sort of eosinophilic infiltration um, and just a very, um, just sort of a profound eosinophilia, pu profound pulmonary eosinophilia. Um, from a, uh, you know, from a lab, a lab standpoint, the ANA being positive um, is, you know, again, it's sort of, it's good to know, um, hard to know what it means in the absence of sort of other serologies being positive. Um, and, you know, it, it, the other challenge too is sometimes, you know, we'll see people with autoimmune diseases like lupus and other things, and they'll have some eosinophilia, um, but it won't be the predominant thing. And to me, like the eosinophilia is like the, the, the sort of blinking red light here that seems to be the problem as opposed to the ANA. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, the 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 negative eGPA is is, is interesting because we actually diagnose we I, we see negative eGP we see negative ANCAs I should say uh, the negative ANCAs is interesting because we see negative ANCAs in eGPA more often than we see positives. You're more likely to be negative than positive. It's sort of a coin flip, but more usually, usually it's negative as opposed to positive, um, which can be difficult because we're sort of like, we wanna find it. And often we have to go hunting for, um, for like other tissue to biopsy potentially to try to, to see evidence um, of eosinophilic infiltration. But when you have eosinophil counts this high, um, a negative ANCA um, to me is still like doesn't, it doesn't make me think that eGPA is actually any less, it doesn't make me think eGPA is any less likely, actually. Yeah, and I, I was gonna make that same point too about the ANA being positive, but everything else being negative is, um, that is something as a, as a growing pulmonologist, uh, something that I've made personal note of many times is I wish I wish everything would be positive and, and make the diagnosis, but so often, um, only one thing is positive or they're all negative, but the patient still very strongly supports an autoimmune process um, or something of the like. So, um, so I agree with Avi in this case of, you know, the ANA is positive, but just because the ANCAs are negative um, does not take eGPA off the list for me. So in, with the mention of this mucosal hypervascularity, I'm not sure if there um, was like a picture of what that is. Um, or if there were any like transbronchial biopsies done um, over these um, lesions in the lung, uh, but those would be helpful things to inform our decision making as well. Yeah, unfortunately, no pictures in the chart of the airway inspection. Um, so I'm not sure um, what they were kind of implying with that either. Um, in terms of kind of case wrap up and what we sort of did with all of this information. Um, our pulmonology team ended up calling her chronic eosinophilic pneumonia based on sort of the differential of 65% eosinophils in the BAL with kind of all else being negative. Um, and she didn't really continue to have bloody sputum or bloody noses and um, her renal function was okay. And so I think um, without other parts of eGPA, they ended up calling it chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, she did go on to have pulmonary function tests. Uh, it showed a moderate obstructive ventilatory defect, uh, which did also improve after administration of an inhaled bronchodilator. And so also our interpretation of this was, you know, she did have a severe asthma exacerbation, but with this background of the asthma plus that you guys are referring to. Um, and then in terms of treatment for this patient over time, they did try again, um, sort of a shorter taper of steroids, uh, kind of a three to four week taper initially. Uh, but after the steroids were stopped, her symptoms did start to worsen again. Uh, so she ended up being started on a biologic um, therapy. Dupilumab is what they went with when I was looking into this. Um, maybe with eosinophil is not the best biologic, but it appears to be working for her. All the follow-up uh, since that time, she's had a lot of improvement in her symptoms and hasn't had any exacerbations. Um, and this was some time ago now, so um, she's doing well. Jess, thank you so much for this really fascinating case presentations, lots of twists and turns. Um, I know we're getting up to the hour, so I'll, I'll pass the mic to maybe Kate first and then Avi to get your reflections on the case and if there are, you know, a few learning points you really wanted to highlight for all the learners listening. Uh, yeah, so this is this was a great case, Jess. Um, eosinophilia is always is one that we like to think about because um, it comes with lots of nifty, um, more atypical diagnoses. Um, so, you know, I think looking back at her her presentation, um, I think the, the warning signs were there, um, not to say that anybody missed anything, um, but I think obviously with this being like her fourth presentation, um, with now looking back every time that her steroids and, and uh, asthma therapies ended in that acute phase, then her symptoms came back. So I think the, the repetition of her symptoms um, strongly alluded to there being something more than just simple asthma there. Um, I, I would start wondering about, you know, retrospectively, um, were there eosinophils present at her prior diagnoses? 
Um, so, you know, while you don't need daily differentials on patients, certainly while they're in the hospital, um, differentials can be um, abundantly useful, um, especially as we saw here, that was kind of the thing that um, took us in a, in a very explicit direction during this case. Um, so, and then uh, with the abnormal imaging, uh, certainly something that with that abnormal x-ray, um, and that was something I thought of earlier too, is um, would you get a, a CAT scan on this patient? If, yeah, this was her third or fourth time coming in, but it sounds like asthma. Yeah, she's got some abnormalities on a chest x-ray. Um, would you get a CT scan on her? Because uh, we talked about, would you bronc her? Um, but would you get a CT scan? You know, we're, we're all operating in that cost conscious um, will it change your management kind of question, uh, which is a super important one. Uh, but I think there was enough there from the beginning that we were kind of picking at all along that absolutely, this is a, a person that needed that CAT scan. It informed how we approached her case. Um, so yeah, I think this was a really, really great case and a really good example of EGPA or the, the chronic uh, eosinophilic pneumonia. Yeah, I agree. This is an outstanding case. And I think it highlights a lot of the the sort of the challenges of taking care of patients with, with severe asthma um, and sort of having to think about, like I said, two things at once, right? Stabilization and sort of understanding perhaps the underlying thing. And, you know, I will say it can be very challenging to differentiate chronic eosinophilic pneumonia from EGPA in these situations where you don't have tissue. Um, so I think, I guess I might suggest that the document that, that it may be in doubt a little bit in the sense that um, sort of lung involvement with EGPA can be just be very hard to differentiate from CEP without, um, without tissue. Um, often the management can be similar in the sense that you can sort of target the eosinophil axis, like you said, with biologics, um, including say something like mepolizumab. Um, you know, so there are sort of are in steroids as well. So there's, there's sort of others, oh, there's, there's um, clinical overlap and therapeutic overlap as well. Um, but this is a case, I think, if there was sort of any remaining diagnostic doubt, trying to think about getting, um, getting tissue, um, even from say places like the sinuses, right? So if there's any sort of sinus moment, if you see eosinophils there, um, you know, that would be helpful for a diagnosis of EGPA versus not. Um, you know, and I think the other thing, the interesting thing about chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, so the classic thing, it presents as sort of that photonegative um, of pulmonary edema, right? I think that's the classic, right? So it tends to involve sort of the, 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 plural, the sub plural spaces more than more um, sort of proximal. Um, so that's something that you can sort of, if you, if, you, if you see that, if you see sort of that photo negative sign for pulmonary edema um, in someone with peripheral eosinophils, think about chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I think I would think that she's sort of existing somewhere on the spectrum of an eosinophilic lung disease and sort of wondering which one is predominating. And I think at follow-up when things had cooled off, thinking about trying to get some tissue. Incredible. Well, I just want to um, huge thank you to Jess for presenting such a, an educational case um, and to Kate and Avi for a phenomenal discussion. We've covered so much asthma plus syndromes, lung sounds, approach to eosinophilia, bronchoscopy, just so much. So um, really can't thank you both enough for the incredible teaching. Uh, and thanks to all the team members who helped make this happen. Um, and we'll end the, the VMR there. So thank you all so much. Bye, everyone.